Well, good evening. Um, my name is Peter de Haan. I work here as the um, one of the biology instructors at Berkeley City College. Um, welcome to the Berkeley City College seminar series. The series are sponsored by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Barbara de Rocher, basically received this prestigious grant from the from this institution. And this grant allows students to, in the bio, biotechnology program, to do paid internship at institutions like UC Berkeley, UCSF, um, Children's Hospital in Oakland. And they will do research basically in the stem cell field. Tonight we are um, joined by Professor Christopher Cheng. Um, Dr. Cheng is professor of chemistry and molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley and is a researcher at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And you will see over there uh, also is aligned to many other departments at UC Berkeley and LBL. Um, his research is focused on the chemical biology um, and inorganic chemistry with particular interest in molecular imaging in, and applied neuroscience metabolic and infectious diseases, and sustainable energy. Most recently, Dr. Cheng was awarded the 2013 American Chemical Society Nobel Laureate Signature Award in Graduate Education, the 2013 Bakeland Prize, and the 2015 Blavatnik Award in Chemistry. In today's seminar, Dr. Cheng will um, talk about the incredible puzzle of photosynthesis, um, uh, the development of a synthetic leaf, and basically he will talk about, I think, the sequestering of uh, carbon dioxide from this atmosphere into carbohydrates. And so it is with my great pleasure to introduce you to you Dr. Christopher Cheng. Well, thank, thanks a lot for the uh introduction and for the invitation to come. So let's just uh, get started. So I'm gonna sort of build up the story of a synthetic leaf uh, by going back to chemistry. And so the first slide is probably something that you wouldn't necessarily equate with chemistry, but I wanna use it as a way to explain as a metaphor what chemistry can do and the way that we think about chemistry and how to put molecules and materials together. So this is a picture of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And so if you look at it, um, you have many different types of instruments, many different types of musicians. And so by mixing and matching the different types of instruments, the different types of players, you can basically make almost any type of sound, any type of music that you want in combination. And so this is the way that we think about the periodic table. And so the elements really are instruments or voices or musicians. And so each one has its own personality. Each one has its own unique types of properties. But what chemists are able to do is mix and match these different types of elements and different combinations in order to make new molecules and new materials that haven't existed before. And so I like the analogy between chemistry and music in the fact that even though you might not know how to play an instrument or sing or write music, you can still appreciate music. And just because you aren't a chemist that goes into the lab and makes chemical molecules or chemical materials, Everything around you, everything from that pen or cell phone or chair is actually made up of molecules and materials that are from combinations of these types of elements. And so you really can appreciate not only the functional aspects of chemistry, but the beauty of chemistry in the same way that you can appreciate music. Okay, and so what we do in the laboratory is study two different aspects of chemistry. And so we apply our fundamental chemical knowledge to problems that are really, I would say, small, and personal to big, things that'll be global. And so the first sort of area, which I'm not gonna talk about tonight, but I'll just sort of outline briefly, is our interest in neuroscience. And so it's a basic question of how does consciousness come about? How does, at the chemical level, the elements combine to give you perception or personality, higher level sort of cognition, your instincts or your long-term types of memories? And so each part of the brain is made up of a different combination of elements. 
and it turns out that this unique type of organ contains more elements at higher concentrations than any other part of your body in any species throughout the entire sort of world. And so the chemistry of the brain is incredibly unique, and what we're interested in is understanding one element at a time, one sort of molecule at a time, how these sort of underlying properties will sort of give rise from the basic chemical elements. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is our focus on energy. And so this is a problem that's also very personal. Everybody needs energy, but it's also global because everybody needs energy. Everyone has a greater need than just themselves. And so I'm gonna talk about it in the context of what we use energy for, where we get it from, and some of the sort of opportunities that are there uh, in order to look and research into alternative energy sources. And so I mentioned that energy is personal yet global, and so each one of us has sort of a carbon footprint or an energy need. And so what, what do we need energy for? And so we need it in our daily lives. All of the sort of energy that we need to make the fertilizer to grow food. Uh, there's a process called the Haber-Bosch process, which was invented around World War I. Uh, it's responsible for feeding the planet. About 50% of the planet's population is fed by fertilizer, which comes from this type of process. And so just to feed ourselves, there's a large sort of energy cost across the planet in order just to make fertilizer from nitrogen gas that comes from the atmosphere. Um, of course, you need clean water. It's one of the biggest challenges, especially in the developing world today, and how to purify clean water from reuse, um, I would say, or from ocean sources that have seawater and other sort of bacterial contaminants. And so in order to purify water, in order to make the filters or make the distillation apparatuses or the different types of devices that you need to filter or kill off bacteria, that costs energy as well. Transportation, uh, this is quite an obvious one. So I'm gonna get back to this point later, but fossil fuels, we burn a lot of fossil fuels and that costs energy. And so all of the transportation needs from land vehicles to air vehicles to sea vehicles, both for personal as well as for industrial sort of transportation, this is a huge cost of energy across the planet. And then of course electricity, especially in the developed industrialized world. And so all of the power that you get from either a, a grid or from batteries has to come from somewhere. And so there's a large energy usage that's taken up by electricity. And that comes to the environment. And so the question is, how do we get sources of energy that will minimize the impact on the environment? And I show just an example with a coral reef. Um, and I'll bring up the point of the chemistry of how we're losing these types of coral reefs by taking up too much energy in inefficient ways. Okay, so where do we get our energy today? And most of it is by burning carbon, carbon sources, carbon sources to make coal, oil, natural gas, or wood. All of these, if you break them down to a materials or molecular level, have a high carbon content. And so when you combust these different forms of carbon, whether they be coal, oil, natural gas, or wood, they actually all go to the same molecular product. No matter how you sort of view these, from a chemistry point of view, you take these with oxygen and heat, and then you create CO2, and that releases the energy. And so all of the fossil fuel use basically goes to a single type of molecule. No matter how diverse the type of source of where you find it, or how you purify it, or how you use it, it all actually ends up going to one product, which is carbon dioxide. And that's actually pretty amazing, but also staggering at the same time when you think about the energy use of fossil fuels across the planet. And so if you take that basic chemistry, what we're doing as a planet is making one molecule, right? And so if you think about the diversity of chemistry across the planet, humankind is really shifting it towards one molecule rather than many different types of molecules. And of course, if you shift something towards one thing, that usually is a bad, a bad sort of outcome. And so as you can see here, we're not really stopping our use of fossil fuels these days. And so in your sort of children's, or at least children's children's types of lifetimes by 2040, what you can see here is that the fossil fuel use is still going to be quite large. 
And so the vast majority of energy that we need and use is gonna come from these main sort of fossil fuel sources. And although, if you look at the percentages, they're growing quite fast in terms of renewables like solar, wind, and biofuels, it's still quite small. And the idea here is that we would like to flip it. What we'd like to do is be able to replace the broad use of these fossil fuels with energy sources that will be more renewable. And that's really the grand challenge for the sort of next generation. In fact, in the Paris climate meetings that we saw this week, if you read any of the news, there are many, many different types of countries that are all sort of vested into turning these sort of sources into these types of sources and mitigating the release of CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay, and so this is a picture, a cartoon, which really links the release of CO2, the uptake of CO2, and our global energy usage. And before we had the industrialized world, basically all of this was in balance. All the CO2 that came in and all the CO2 that came out was perfectly a one-to-one -one type of correspondence, or what was called a zero-sum game. And so what you have is you have photosynthesis. And so photosynthesis will capture light, solar energy that comes from the sun, and then fix it within plants in order to make sugars, biomass, as well as fossil fuels from the remains of animals. The oceans, because they cover two-thirds to three-quarters of the planet, this would be the other sort of natural way to take up CO2 that's made in the atmosphere. And so you have land sort of based ways to sort of sequester CO2, and then you have water sort of aqueous ways to sequester CO2. And then before all we had was fossil fuels naturally decay, plants would give off CO2 if they were being eaten and combusted, and then you have all organisms across the planet plant and animal respiration. And so the imbalance has come about because of our growing needs for energy. This box, combustion, basically what you have here is that photosynthesis and ocean uptake were enough, but now we have a huge imbalance because there's a growing population and a need for more and more industrialization. And so what happens to the two main sources of CO2 sequestration, which would be the water as well as the land, gets into these types of situations. And so if there's too much CO2, there's only so much that water can take. And so water you can drink, at, and so the tap water that you get out of your sort of faucet is about pH five or so. Um, any sort of water that you sort of sit in ambient air would be about five. But it turns out that if you have too much CO2, CO2 can act like an acid, and it keeps lowering and lowering the pH of water if there's too much CO2 from the atmosphere and it gets soaked up by the oceans. Now the consequence of that is really the loss of life in anything that's living in that water because what you've literally done is freshman chemistry and changed the pH of the oceans across the planet. And it's a huge amount, right, of CO2 in order to change pH units in the ocean. And so this is a picture locally from the Florida Keys. And so you can see just in the last 30 years, you've lost a huge amount of life from the sort of coral, as well as many of the different sort of fish and other sort of sea animals that can't live in a pH environment which is different than in their sort of parents and their parents' parents' sort of generations. Same thing happens on land. And so what happens with rising temperatures is that CO2, once it can't be sequestered by the ocean anymore, it exists in the atmosphere. And so what will happen is CO2, even though it's a colorless gas, it absorbs near-infrared radiation from the sun. And so what happens is that that sunlight that's supposed to hit us on the planet and cause more photosynthesis is actually getting trapped in the atmosphere by the literally CO2 polluting the atmosphere. And that leads to rising temperatures, which again can lead to things like loss of ice formations, but more generally a rise in global temperatures, which affects land use as well as different types of climate change. And so it's a very sort of simple equation. Too much CO2 leads to lower pH and rising temperatures, two very, very basic aspects of the planet's sort of habitat. And so this is the scale of the problem. So in the next, I would say, 25, 35 types of years, 
This is the global energy need now. This is what we're gonna need in the future. And so it's about double from sort of estimates. And to give you a scale of it, it would be like having the planet agree to build 25,000 new nuclear power plants. And so if you think about it in the United States, we haven't built one since the 1970s because they can be, of course, quite dangerous. And so the scale of the energy problem is like having to build 25,000 of them across the planet. And I don't think that we could get everybody to agree on that. However, the benefit of this sort of scale is the fact that we have a ready energy source. We just don't know how to use it yet. And that's solar capacity. And so it dwarfs what you would need in terms of all humankind to date. And so what hits the planet in a given year is 120,000 terawatts. And so you don't really need to know the units of terawatts per se, but 120,000 is a lot bigger than the 20 jump that one would need to feed the planet's doubling of population as well as further industrialization. So that's a good thing. There's a lot of energy available. We're not actually running out of energy. We just don't know how to use it and tap into it effectively. And so what is the major challenge? And so, of course, there are many, but there is one major challenge. The one major challenge is that it's obvious. Sunlight doesn't hit the same spot every time of every day. It's intermittent, right? There's day and night across different parts of the planet. And so you can use solar energy during the day, but if you don't have any way to store it, you don't have any energy at night, or you don't have any energy when the sun doesn't shine. And so we have a lot hitting the planet, but we don't have is we don't have the ability to harness it, store it, and then use it when we want to use it. And so what we're doing is this disconnect. We have a lot of energy that's hitting the planet. We don't use it. What we're doing is we're basically taking up all of the carbon from the planet and burning it to CO2 because we can do this on demand. And so it's really mainly for our convenience that we use fossil fuels, not because of any sort of other type of reason. And so what we want to transition to is what is called solar fuels. And the idea here is that we want to close this type of terminal loop. We don't want to keep generating more and more CO2. What we'd like to do is be able to ultimately convert that CO2 back to usable forms of carbon and make what is called a carbon neutral sort of energy cycle. And the idea here is that if you can now break down this wall, this barrier, to make solar intermittent, you can sort of close this type of cycle. And now you can use the same sort of infrastructure that you're using before, but couple it to a sort of a solar device. And then you would have potentially as much energy as you would want. And so there are two different ways to do this. And I'm gonna show you two different sort of chemical cycles. And so the two chemical solutions in a basic sort of framework would be what, one what is called water splitting, in which we actually don't use any CO2 at all. What we do is what is called a hydrogen economy, meaning that we use water as our feedstock. We use solar energy to split it into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen gets burned by oxygen and water vapor is released. And so this doesn't actually rely on CO2 whatsoever. And there are such things, of course, as hydrogen cars, hydrogen runs sort of fuel cells, hydrogen batteries per se. So that's one sort of approach, which is water splitting. The other approach is CO2 reduction itself, direct reduction of the greenhouse gas that we're putting into the atmosphere. And so the idea here is that instead of burning carbon to CO2, then what we can do is take the same CO2, recycle it, recapture it, use energy from the sun to rearrange the bonds of CO2 into these other forms of carbon for use on demand. And so Either way, uh, there really isn't a right or wrong answer to this, and so that's why the scientific community is very interested in both the sort of water splitting model as well as sort of the CO2 reduction model. And so the question is, how do we design new types of systems for solar chemical conversion? And so water splitting or CO2 reduction are both what are gonna be termed solar to chemical conversion types of processes. And so for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna show you the approaches that we've taken to sort of solve this type of problem. And so we're inspired by nature, and that's where the synthetic leaf comes from. And so photosynthesis is nature's solar to chemical process. Because what happens is that plants make their own food and they make their own bodies. 
And so what it does is it takes solar energy, green leaves, water, because plants need water to grow, and then they convert CO2 into their own food. They eat the food to make their own bodies. And so this idea comes in terms of photosynthesis. And so what a leaf does is it harvests solar energy in the first step using chlorophyll. So chloroplasts are structures within this material leaf. Chlorophyll is the dye, the pigment, uh, which gives them their green color. Water will enter the leaf through the roots, and so plants need water to grow. And then what you have are two what are called catalysis steps, or chemical conversion steps. And so the light energy and water that comes into the plant converts into NADPH, which is nature's form of hydrogen. And so instead of making hydrogen, which is a gas, it makes this molecule NADPH, which is a molecule which is soluble and can flow through the leaf, uh, just like sort of a conduit. Then what you have is you use catalysis again in a second step where carbon dioxide enters the leaf. Then this uses this hydrogen source plus CO2 to convert CO2 into sugar. And so that's called biomass, which is going to be the food in the body of the plant. And so what you have here is light capture or solar capture, and then two steps of catalysis, one that involves water and one that involves carbon dioxide. And so by doing solar capture plus catalysis, this is how photosynthesis occurs. And so this gives us sort of the inspiration and the blueprint for what we want to do. So what we want to do is imitate life. We want to make a synthetic leaf. So to reiterate, natural photosynthesis takes light, water, CO2, does solar capture and catalysis, and make sugar or biomass. And so the mixture builds the plant's food, which makes its own body. So instead, what we want to do is carry out what is called artificial photosynthesis. And so the concepts, the starting materials are the same, solar energy, water, and carbon dioxide. But instead of having a leaf, which gives you no choice, a leaf makes its own body, right? And so if we made natural photosynthesis, we'd only be able to replicate the leaf itself. What we want to do is expand the ability of photosynthesis to make not only fuels, but maybe food or medicine or biodegradable types of materials. And so we want to choose which one of these targets that we make. Where nature is limited in this sort of beautiful process by making its own body, what we want to do is take this type of concept and then translate it to something that we can use for sort of societal types of benefits but using the same sort of ideas, the same sort of starting materials. OK. So what we need is we need the ability to do solar chemistry. And so just by putting these two on the same sort of chart, you can either take hydrogen or carbon, burn them to water or CO2. And then what you need to do is use solar energy to convert either water or CO2 back to those types of fuels, those starting materials for making larger types of more complicated structures. And so in this red box are the simple chemical reactions that we want to perform, the catalysis that we want to carry out. It's deceptively difficult to do these types of reactions. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of researchers across the world that are trying to do this at small and large types of scales. And so our approach is really to broaden our view of chemistry to fields that are sort of allied with it. And that would be material science and biology. And so the way that we think about the problem is that we want to perform chemistry, but we draw inspiration, or we actually draw the actual components from biological systems or material systems. And so in order to carry out what is called the solar fuel catalysis, we can mix chemistry with materials, or we can mix chemistry with biology, or in some cases, we can mix materials and biology together. And so it's of a more holistic approach to science in the way that the traditional barriers of math, chemistry, physics, material science, biology are sort of molded together because the problem at hand is something that's larger than one discipline can handle. And so it's an interdisciplinary approach. And of course, we want things to be fast, efficient, durable, and selective. But most importantly, because it's a synthetic type of leaf, 
it needs to be environmentally friendly. So everything that we want to make is something that's going to exist under sort of ambient conditions on a bench top or on a kitchen top in water and stable to the outdoors potentially. Okay, and so I'm going to show you a few examples of the catalytic uh, types of processes that we've been carrying out. So the first example I'm going to show you is with hydrogen, generation of hydrogen from water. Um, and so what's being used today mainly is platinum, a very precious metal that's expensive. However, there are new types of rocks, uh, minerals that you can find. You can dig them out uh, of many different types of mining uh, sort of, uh, well, mining sites. Um, and some of them have the ability to carry out this type of reaction. And one of these minerals is molybdenite. Uh, and the chemical sort of formula is MOS2. It's a picture of molybdenite MOS2 ore. But what you can do as a chemist is you can take that sort of material and then analyze the material in terms of what it looks like at the molecular level. And this is what it looks like at the molecular level. So this is the molybdenum. These are the sulfur atoms. So the green atoms are this. The yellow atoms are this. And so what you see here is at a molecular level, this mineral has a repeating unit of these MOS2 types of triangles. And so instead of digging up these types of rocks uh, across the world and searching for them, what we decided to do was synthesize these types of triangles in the lab. Because we know the chemical molecular structure of these types of rocks, we can replicate that in the laboratory. And so what we ended up doing is taking organic molecules and then making MOS2 triangles that can be housed within these discrete and synthetic types of rocks, per se. And the idea here is that these now can do the same reaction. They can take water and then generate hydrogen uh, using either a solar or solar electrical type of input. And so by mimicking rocks, what we can do is make new types of chemical catalysts. And so here's some of the data. Again, you can draw the analogy between this MOS2 triangle and this MOS2 triangle from the rock. Uh, this is just data to show you that it's a robust catalyst that we can even use in seawater. And so we can take seawater from the San Francisco Bay and then convert that to hydrogen using these sorts of artificial types of chemical rocks that we've been able to develop in the laboratory. And this is some uh, spectroscopy which shows that the unit is exactly like a rock before and after the chemical process. And so a catalyst is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical process, it just facilitates it. And this is sort of the definitive proof which shows that the rock is there before, the rock is there afterwards. And so it's reusable for the process. Second sort of example I'm going to show you is with carbon dioxide. And so we got the inspiration for these uh, actually from a child's game, Tinker Toys. Uh, my colleague at UC Berkeley, Omar Yagi, is one of the pioneers in this type of area. And so just like Tinker Toys, you can mix and match these different types of corners and these different types of struts to make almost any shape that you want. And so we looked at building molecules just like you would build from basic Tinker Toy type of structures. And so the reason why we wanted to use Tinker Toys instead of Legos is the fact that if you look at Tinker Toys, they make hollow structures, right? Where Legos are blocks. And typically, if you build structures from those types of blocks, you'll get solid structures. And so the reason why the Tinker Toy analogy became very important to us is because carbon dioxide is a gas. And so what we didn't want to do is build structures that were solid, where gas couldn't penetrate. We wanted to build structures like Tinker Toys, which were hollow and had the ability to have gas flow through them. And so here's what Omar came up with in terms of the structures, and then we adapted that in order to capture carbon dioxide and then use it for catalytic reactions. And so these are what are called covalent organic frameworks. And so these types of building blocks designated as molecules are exactly like these types of corners here. And then the different types of struts are exactly like the struts you would have here. And so predictably, what Omar's group has been able to do and launched an entire field, is that if you choose the right building blocks and struts, you can make predictable three-dimensional structures that extend in space, but are also hollow and permanently hollow. 
And that becomes extremely important because what these building blocks can now be are catalysts. Now we can have these types of hollow structures with catalysts at well-defined sites at a molecular level, but yet make them hollow so gases can pass through. And so this becomes particularly important because we want to either change carbon dioxide, which is a gas, into other types of chemical products, or we want to make hydrogen, which is a gas, from water. And so in each case, a hollow structure is much more effective for these types of purposes than a solid structure. And then finally, with these types of struts and building blocks, we wanted to make things that would be water stable. And so there's another version of these covalent organic frameworks, which are called metal organic frameworks, which have many of the same properties, but many of them are not as water stable. Okay, so this is what the chemistry would look like. And so if you look at uh, the organic building blocks, you can take the same sort of catalyst unit, but this building block has one benzene ring. This has two benzene rings. And so this strut is shorter. This strut is slightly longer. And so you can see the hollow boxes here. This type of box gives you structures which have holes that are this big. And you can make them bigger or bigger or smaller depending on the types of units that you use for these types of struts. And so the idea is that this shape and this shape are identical. The only thing that's different are that the holes get bigger or smaller depending on what you choose as your starting materials. And that becomes very important because in certain cases it's empirical. We really don't know how to precisely design these types of catalysts. So what we need to be able to do is make a variety of different sizes and find the Goldilocks. We need to find the one that's not too big or not too small for the type of application. So the surface area of these types of hollow structures is amazing. So a gram, which is basically, I don't know, like half a stick of chewing gum. Basically, you can cover an entire football field of surface area with something that's about that size, right? And so there's a huge amount of gas that can touch the insides of these hollow structures, almost like a football field in a very, very sort of small, handheld type of catalyst. And that becomes important because it gives you a much, much higher efficiency for these types of reactions. And the reaction that we're carrying out to begin with as a first test case is carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide, which then can be used for what is called syngas and making many different types of diesel additives. And so this is just some of the data. I'm not going to take you through all of the technical details. But what you can do is analyze these types of catalysts in many different ways versus the molecule itself or the molecule within the sort of tinker toy framework. Uh, the expansion, as I just told you, bigger or smaller types of pores, adding different types of metals in these units, and then long-term stability. It basically goes, our prototype is about two days long. Uh, we'd like to get it to weeks to months. Right now, we're sort of working on that. But at the very beginning, we were only getting catalysts that were stable for minutes um, at a time. And so getting something that would be stable for a couple of days, you change the filter, it's not such a bad start. Um, and so these are sort of the sum of the metrics that we have here. Okay, so now let's start to put this all together. And so what I've shown you is the catalysis to make hydrogen or to make carbon dioxide. And so now what we want to do is take those catalyst pieces and then put them together with a solar capture device to actually make a synthetic leaf. And so what I focused on just now was catalysis, right? the catalysis part. Now what we want to do is couple it to the solar part. And so again, just to reiterate, natural photosynthesis takes these components and makes biomass. And so what we want to do is take these same components and then make fuels or food or medicine or materials. And the way that we're going to do this is actually by co-opting different types of environmental organisms that you would find across the planet. And so the idea here is that we wanted to make catalysts that would have the ability to live, to renew, to self-repair. And instead of mimicking biology, what we decided to do was work hand in hand with biology. And the idea here is that the synthetic leaf is not really all synthetic per se, but what it is is something man-made that will be compatible with something that we find in the living environment. 
And so what I draw up here are the types of biology catalysts that we're using are from the same sort of yeast and bacteria that you would use to brew beer or bake bread or even make yogurt. And so what we do is we search for different types of interesting environmental organisms that we can domesticate and then use those domesticated organisms in conjunction with the ability to solar power them, right? And so that's the combination that we want to carry out between the solar and catalysis. The materials will do the solar, the biology will do the catalysis. And so here's a blueprint for what we want to do in terms of designing a synthetic leaf and where the chemistry will break down. And so I'll give you a little bit of an overview of photosynthesis in more detail. What happens is that light harvesting and charge separation are other words for solar capture. So sunlight comes into this photosystem, and then what it does is it turns water into oxygen, and then nature's version of hydrogen, which is NADPH. This is called generation of a reductant, a reducing agent. This NADPH will then get fixed by carbon dioxide in what is called the Calvin cycle. And so Melvin Calvin, professor at Berkeley, won the Nobel Prize for how this process works, tracing the aspects of how carbon dioxide is made into sugars within plants. And so there are many, many steps, but you end up getting your target molecule from carbon fixation. And so at each step in this natural photosynthetic cycle, we want to make a synthetic or artificial type of mimic of that. So instead of a photosystem, which is basically a dye embedded in a leaf, we want to start to use semiconductors instead. So we are very familiar with solar panels. Most of them are built on silicon, but there are many other types of materials that are coming online. And then couple that with other inorganic materials that can take water to oxygen and then generate hydrogen. Then what we want to do is find environmental organisms that will take this hydrogen and what is called autotrophic metabolism and take hydrogen and carbon dioxide into a given target molecule. And I'm going to show you some examples of the different types of domesticated organisms that you can take. And they're the same things that some cases you can even buy at the store or, um, or even uh, dig up out of the ground uh, to make these types of target molecules. So here's one example. And so what we are doing in this case is solar energy capture using a solar panel and then coupling that with a hydrogen evolution catalyst. So another type of material that can take that solar energy and split water into hydrogen. Then we feed that hydrogen and carbon dioxide that's open to the air with different types of biological organisms, cells, each one of the bodies of these organisms is only a single cell. And in this case, what we're able to do is make natural gas, uh, which is methane, the major component of natural gas, which is a value-added chemical. And so light, material, biology, CO2 gives you natural gas, a value-added chemical product that you could use for cooking, household heating, directly from carbon dioxide that you can do on a, on a kitchen countertop. And so this is what the device looks like. These are the types of organisms in particular. We use this organism called M. barkeri. It turns out that this is an archaea, which is related to bacteria and yeast, uh, but it's got properties of both. What it does is it's very, very good at absorbing hydrogen from the atmosphere and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to make methane. And so what we can do is essentially make a glorified teacup with two compartments. And in this case, you have a solar panel hooked up, which will generate electricity. That electricity will then be used on a material to make hydrogen. That hydrogen, which is sitting in this water aqueous solution, will feed into these M. barkerized. And then CO2 plus the hydrogen will give you methane. And then oxygen is made on the other side and separated by a membrane for the other sort of splitting half reaction of water. And so the idea here is that just on a countertop with a solar panel, a couple of electrodes, and then sprinkling in some of these sort of organisms, you can make natural gas from light, water, and CO2. And so what we've been able to do is then expand this type of idea and then mix and match 
Just like if you wanted to make a certain type of bread, you can mix and match the different types of yeast. If you wanted to brew a different type of beer, you can mix and match different types of yeast for that as well, for taste. Now what we're doing is we're making much, much more complicated molecules and materials. So I showed you methane, which is a simple molecule. Well, now we can do a solar capture from sunlight and these sort of semiconductors, and I'll show you these are in a nanowire format. These will make food, and so acetate, which is the, basically the key ingredient in vinegar. So now what we can do is we can make a simple food stuff from CO2. The first sort of bacteria gives you food. That food can be fed into another type of bacteria to then make different types of medicines and materials. And so in this case, we can make next generation biodiesels, such as butanol. We can make biodegradable plastics, that these are sort of com uh, compostable types of plastics that you can make bottles and other things with, as well as different types of precursors to pharmaceuticals that you can use for antimicrobial, or in some cases, even anti-cancer types of therapeutics. And so you don't need to know all of the sort of chemistry and the structures, but they're much, much more complicated. But what they share is that all of the sort of carbon ultimately comes from carbon dioxide. And so you can start to make food, medicines, materials, as well as different types of food, fuels uh, from this type of tandem process. And so this is what it looks like in a sort of a schematic. And so instead of using regular solar panels, uh, what my colleague Pei Dong Yang at Berkeley has been most famous for is making solar panels that are not flat, but ones that are what are called nanowires, which look like blades of grass. And so in this case, instead of having a flat solar panel, what you have here are solar panels which are made up of sort of blades. And this idea is it gives you much more surface area because the sun not only hits a flat surface, it can hit up and down all of the different types of surface that the wire gives you. And so in the same physical space, in two-dimensional space, you would have the ability to harvest much more light than you would before by stacking on top of each other. What this allows you to do is bring in one sort of photoanode, what we call, to make water into oxygen. Then the protons will generate hydrogen, which then goes into acetic acid because we have these types of bacteria to make food. This food is then fed into other bacteria to make all of these other types of precursors. And it really isn't science fiction. So this sort of schematic cartoon is exactly what the device looks like. And so this is a high resolution image of the actual sort of blades of grass type of structure that you can see with a high resolution microscope. And so if you look at the units, these are micron units. And so the, each of these wires is about, I don't know, about the size of a human hair or so, things of that sort. So things that you couldn't even necessarily see, but at the nanometer scale look like blades of grass. And then these are the bacterial organisms which sort of climb and sit almost like uh, jelly beans or Easter eggs hiding in the grass. And so with that, what we have is the ability to carry out what is called artificial photosynthesis. So light capture and water and carbon dioxide catalysis, these are sort of the nanowires which are drawn in sort of cartoon form which do the solar harvesting. In this case, we can either use biology or chemistry in order to make catalysts. We've demonstrated it for methane. And now what we were doing is starting to use the ability to look at basic metabolism and biology and find different organisms that will essentially help us make pharmaceuticals or different types of materials. I showed you biodegradable plastics, but these are magnets that you can make, that organisms that can construct, and then different types of sustainable fuels. And I show you different types of diesel structures here. And so with that, I just wanted to close to say that solar offers a very abundant potential source of energy. It really dwarfs the human energy needs of today and tomorrow. But new catalysts are really needed for the two key reactions to help store that solar energy without release of excess CO2 in the environment. And so hydrogen production from water splitting, as well as any form of carbon dioxide reduction can help this problem. Photosynthesis in the leaf provides a blueprint for how to couple the solar capture with catalysis so you can store solar energy in the form of mixing water 
and carbon dioxide into a chemical fuel. But what the synthetic leaf does is it goes beyond this in terms of not only being able to make sugar, but we can actually turn this into food or fuels, medicines, and different types of materials. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank uh, all of the students as well as the different types of professors that I work with at UC Berkeley. Highly dynamic and collaborative environment. And so um, I'd like to point out uh, the students first. Uh, Hema was a joint student between my lab and Professor Jeff Long's lab. She's now started her own independent research group as a professor at Stanford. Um, Sarah and Yuji are students of mine. They've actually both gone to faculty positions at Johns Hopkins and Utah State. Uh, my colleague Omar Yagi, who I mentioned that worked on sort of these tinker toy types of structures, and is one student of mine, Song, and one student of his, Christian, working together. And then the projects uh, with the solar sort of biology, Peidong Yang, as well as Michelle Chang, and then one student from Peidong's group, Chong, one student from my group, Eva, and then one student from Michelle's group, Joe, all work as a team on different aspects of building these types of devices. And so with that, I'd be um, happy to answer any questions, and uh, thank you again for listening. So I think it's a, it's a different type of approach uh, because plants are different types of organisms. They're multicellular, and it takes longer for them to grow. Uh, the reason why we go to this type of approach, and they're very complementary, because the idea is that you can take something living and something synthetic and mix them together, almost making a, a bionic type of structure, a cyborg type of structure. Um, the reason why we like the more simple biological organisms that we use is because we're very good at making alcohol, we're very good at making bread. And so those are the sorts of organisms that have been domesticated for much longer. Uh, plants are, again, also relatively straightforward. To, you know, you can make watermelon without seeds and things of that sort. So plants are also a viable option, uh, but they take a larger land mass and then they take um, you know, longer to grow. Um, but, but again, they have their own properties. So, depending on what you want to make, a plant might be better than a yeast or a bacteria. And so that's why I think that they're quite complementary in terms of the overall scientific type of concept. But those are the differences between the two. Question. Yep. Yep. Uh, would you think this could possibly be used in uh, space? In space? Um, I, I, I don't think that there are any sort of limitations uh, in terms of if, if it was actually enclosed in a in a spacecraft, <laughs> um, but there's not enough there's not enough liquid right outside in in the sort of you know vacuum of space in order to carry out these types of processes. We're looking at it more in terms of of doing things because um, my old PhD advisor came up with this terminology personalized energy, um, and so the idea is that what you want to do is you don't really want to depend on especially in the developing world, large infrastructures. You want to be able to carry things like a cell phone or like a pocket calculator, for example, and be able to power that by movement or something that would hit uh, you know, light from the atmosphere as well as water or CO2 that could be directly sort of uh, captured. Um, and so we're looking at all of these in terms of the smallest sort of handheld. Like the, the cartoon that I showed you, most of the devices that we build will fit in a teacup or a water bottle, um, things of that sort. Um, and so if you have enough that then you could use to heat something, then you don't, need, you don't need a lot of infrastructure. And that saves a lot in terms of you know, implementation, right? Because you don't need to build more infrastructure. Um, usually I still use the two microphones. Uh, just, uh, I, <clears throat> one of my and it says a lot how the Right. Uh, what is the breakdown? Uh, do, do you guys know what I, it's only lasting for a minute? Instead of going 
Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's like the tinker toy analogy, right? And so what happens is that the actual struts uh, that sort of make up the structure, the struts themselves, uh, they break down. And so what we're trying to do is, it's not the way that the struts fit into the corners. Those linkages are actually quite stable. It's the struts themselves that are starting to sort of dissolve and break down over time. And so what we're doing is we're trying to sort of uh, tie them back um, and then make sort of a secondary uh, type of interaction in order to stabilize and fortify it, fortify it more. Because it's really only linked in one direction and we'd like to link it with another, right? Another yeah, I was wondering where you got that figure, you were saying that solar provides about 120 terawatts. 120,000 terawatts. Um, uh, with, now, is that, is that available yeah. only to uh, the land on this planet? Or? That, that is basically a total, total amount of energy that hits the planet in about a year. And so it's, it takes into account um, you know, the, the sun and the rotation and everything. And so that's why like, it's the total amount that's hitting. But of course, it's a moving target. right? And so that's the reason why solar intrinsically is difficult to use, because it doesn't hit the same place at the same intensity all the time. And so what you need to do is get it while you can and then store it. And so I think the biggest challenge with solar is a storage problem, not an availability problem per se. Yeah, my, my thing was, you know, currently, what, what do you find to be the best uh, storage options? I understand you know there's like better options, like mechanical, or can be storage Sure. So I think it depends on the application. Uh, so what I would say is for transportation, it unless batteries become a lot better, uh, the density that you need has to be in a fuel which is a molecule or chemical based type of method because if you go back to freshman chemistry, a Lewis dot structure, when you draw a bond between two atoms, that bond represents two electrons, right? And so electrons are what electricity is made of. And so the, the, the smallest space, the tightest, highest density space that you can store electrons is always gonna be within a bond. And so fuels are molecules or are chemicals. And so at some point, you can't get away from fuels for certain types of things like airplanes, right? Um, you can't, but you could run a, a home on a battery, for example, because right, a home just sits on the land. It can be as heavy as it needs to be. But for certain types of applications like transportation, it would be very difficult to get away from a chemical fuel or chemical-based type of fuel. So I think it depends on the application. Oh, so, so what I would say is that if, if you derive things from carbon dioxide, you'll burn them to carbon dioxide. Um, and so there's good and bad things about that. That means it's carbon neutral, meaning that you're, it's net neutral, meaning that you're not making any more carbon dioxide than you started with. So that's a good thing, but it's actually not carbon negative, which you probably actually want. And so that's the reason why the hydrogen sort of economy is very attractive to people, because that's all based on hydrogen, oxygen, and water. So you don't actually have CO2 in any, any type of process. But to be honest, you, you can't get away from carbon because you still need, food is made from carbon-based sources, right? Um, and so that's the reason why. You can make fuels that might go straight from hydrogen, but to actually eat, breathe, live, you still actually need to use carbon. You can't get away from carbon completely. Um, and so the E's in the, um, in the diagrams are basically the, the energy input that you need for the reaction. Um, and so each of the, I, I mean, all of those reactions have a certain amount of energy that it takes to carry out that reaction. And so that's why it's just a generalized. So I don't draw, I mean, otherwise it'd just be a bunch of numbers. For, it's number of electrons for that process to occur. So big E is the amount of energy, small E will be electron and n is the number of electrons. Yes. Yes. Um, so I think that there are, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in, in many aspects of energy storage. I think that energy storage is probably the biggest 
uh, sort of research science then going to engineering and technology type of space. Uh, and that's why there's a diversity of different types of options. So battery research actually turns out to be very hot right now and better ways to store um, solar potentially in you know, electricity types of forms. Um, and then I'm talking about things that you could use as fuels or basically materials or food on demand, right? Um, because you still, if you had a battery, you would still need to use it to clean water or you'd still need it to cook or heat something. Um, and so there has to be some fuel or end product, some molecule or material associated with it. But I think a lot of the, the ways that we go about that um, are, are sort of the, the future. You know. And things are getting smaller and smaller, not bigger and bigger um, in terms of, of renewables. I think things are going towards portable and lighter rather than these big, massive grids because population is growing faster in different parts of the world than, than infrastructure. Yep. In terms of scalability, in your mission, 120,000 terawatts. Mm -hmm. Of that amount, how much do you, I'm not sure if you're there yet, how much of that energy do you feel that this system can capture and mm -hmm. compete with the other uh, sources of energy that we have now? So did you consider about how is it profitable? Sure. Right. So, so it, you know, so it turns out that uh, solar to electricity is, is relatively cheap these days. We just don't know what to do with the electricity. So that's why the catalysis portion of it is still uh, quite wide open right now. Um, and so the, the scale problem, again, I think it has to do with a distribution issue. Not necessarily like you're not going to draw, you're not going to build like a big plant that'll be solar powered. Um, because you can already put solar panels on a house and then you know, minimize electricity use for, for industrialized countries. Um, what you're going to need is you're going to need ways to be able to go out to the field and purify your water on demand or provide heat right, or for, for cooking or for shelter or things of that sort. And so those are still, I would say, at a, at a household or, or sort of a person type of scale. Yeah, that's, and that's really the biggest challenge right now. Um, so because you can, you can get electricity relatively cheaply through solar panels, at least from the industrialized world, but you can't distribute it yet. Uh, actually, maybe someone hasn't asked a question. Um, are the organisms that we use affected by the environment? Yeah, if it's outside or something? The microorganisms? Uh, you know, so a lot of these are, are things that, that are natural living organisms that we find across the planet. They're cataloged um, in different types of phylogenetic trees. Um, and so a lot of times we just go and read the literature or go to like a catalog and say, oh, that makes something that would be interesting. Or this organism makes product A. If we mix it with organism and if they can live together in a community, then A plus B can then give you C. And so that's kind of what we're looking at right now. So they're, they're affected by the environment and the way that they're, they're affected by what, what they need to grow and live and survive, right? So some organisms require a different temperature. Some organisms, you know, require, you know, so light, like certain types of light, certain types of dark, so that, that becomes a complication. Um, some require different oxygen tension because some, they live like in the open air. If some of them, they live like, you know, in, in aqueous environments deeper in this sort of ocean, then they only have a certain oxygen tension. So there are lots of things of that sort. So, uh, yep. Uh, I think that there's a lot of things that have to go into solving climate change types of issues. I mean, I only sort of touched on it because I, I think the bigger challenge is the fact that regardless of, of your views on climate change, which I do believe in, but it's that we are, we are gonna need a lot more energy because there's gonna be a lot more people on the planet whether you like it or not, right? So, so I think that that is just a fact. There's a big energy need because there's a bigger population coming about and bigger industrialization. And so we view it as sort of wanting as many people as possible to contribute to solving the problem. And I think that that's the most important thing. Because depending on where you are, we have certain resources and certain sort of ideas here, but other, you know, 
other, if, if we plug in the same sort of concept, maybe there are local organisms, right, across the world that would be easier to make a certain product somewhere else, right? Just like if you dig a rock out of the ground, you know, certain, certain ores only show up, like in North America versus in Asia, for example. And it's gonna be the same thing with different types of bacteria and yeast as well, or different types of plants would grow better in different types of environments. You guys uh, used uh, yeast or, or bacteria. Is, is there a reason why you didn't use, say, fungus or uh, like a mycorrhizal? So we've actually started working on some fungal or organisms as well. So and and then we're actually also looking at some algae. And so we're not. Um, it just these are the things that we came up with because those were the sorts of. We wanted to come up with simple things to illustrate the concept first. So natural gas was an easy one to say, okay, CO2, natural gas, and it actually is, both of them only have one carbon, so it turned out to be a relatively straightforward thing to start with. These other things were making, um, you know, plastics and, and, you know, these sort of terpene structures, they're much more difficult. So that's gonna depend on the organism. And so, you know, even certain sponges would be useful because they're a source of a lot of natural products. Um, but it's hard, harder to sort of solarize them compared to the simple organisms that we have. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we'll, uh, the, if, if this system is implemented for uh, the coral reefs that are lost, would they come back or something? Well, basically, like, the, the issue is that you'd have to really reverse quite a bit of CO2 out of the atmosphere. You'd have to reverse it in order to change the pH back to what it was. Um, and so that actually probably is almost impossible right now, to be honest, to really reverse uh, and, and sort of take up that much CO2 because the scale is so large. But what you can do is, is sort of keep slowing it down. And I think that's the, because um, the idea is that the, the Paris meetings, they basically are seeing two degrees change every year, and what you need to do is you really need to slow down the temperature changes. Um, and because temperature change is another way to measure, sort of uh, balance the pH, right? So you can measure pH, but by measuring temperature, you're, all, you're, you're measuring what's happening in the atmosphere versus in the water, which is a different metric. You're still in Berkeley, right? No. I moved. Thanks.